Hello, I'm Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I'm going to be talking about the Dragon Quest collab that has just gone live in North America. So, this is the first time this collab has come to our region, and because of that, at least your very first role will not be a duplicate, which means there's a strong likelihood that with at least several roles, you may not necessarily get a duplicate, which is obviously beneficial because I'm a strong believer that the very first time you acquire a given card, it adds some depth to your monster box. Obviously, the amount of depth it adds varies on the card, but for the most part, there's no truly identical cards. And because of that, you may have a chance of filling in a particular void or hole in your monster box that you may not have been able to deal with necessarily. And it may come in handy at some point in time. And with that in mind, I do feel like it is worth at least several rolls, even though it does cost seven magic stones and some of the value may be a bit questionable, just because you are able to acquire at least hopefully various new cards, along with the fact that the bottom rarity at least has weapon assist. They may not necessarily be the greatest weapon assist, but it's a weapon assist. And who knows, maybe that particular combination of awakenings and or active skill may be the perfect fit for your monster box, or it may just come in handy down in the road in the future. Now, that being said, let's take a look at all the cards available. So the first eight star card we have is die. And this is like probably gonna be like the main um, protagonist from the franchise and as a result he's obviously quite strong so in their base form is going to be the most desirable form because Daytona will be released in the near future Daytona is basically the light transforming submarine style card in the sense that he's like Nautilus Royal Oak except he utilizes light TPAs and he also doesn't have any way to deal with damage voids they have huge amounts of personal damage but no VDP awakening and many of their subs don't have VDP awakening and with that in mind die is actually an amazingly powerful sub if in fact, probably one of the best, if not the best, you could have because with their active skill, it's a six turn base cooldown. And for one turn, this particular card, so Die themselves gets five times attack. So they're probably going to be damage capping or double damage capping with relative ease. And then for one turn, you bypass void damage void effects. That's exactly what you need to for Daytona teams. Prior to the release of Dragon Quest, double Halloween Cotton was probably the best way to go, but now you could have like one Halloween Cotton, one die, and have two other subs, and you still could probably do lots of cool and wonderful things. So, just from the active skill alone, you know this is meaningful. And if we take a look at the Awakenings, they have up to seven, no, up to five seven combo Awakenings, which is equivalent to 32 times personal damage with a large attack stat. Now, 10 combo is obviously the more efficient method, and in theory, like, these 5-7 combos take up 5 of their 10 possible awakenings if you factor in super awakening, so it obviously could have been better, like, double 10 combo with, like, anything else, like a TPA or a 7 combo would have been a more efficient usage of awakenings, but at the same time, it is what it is, he still has huge amounts of personal damage. Remember, that active skill will stack with other burst actives, because active skills that buff the damage for the owning card will stack alongside other attack buffs. So there's a great chance he's double capping, even maybe his sub attributes dealing large amounts of damage because 32 times personal damage with a large attack set is going to be meaningful. In addition to this, they have super jammer resist. So they have some resistance, which is great. You free up some active or inheritance slots or just free up some team building options. Furthermore, the water color is meaningful for Sure, a three where the all attribute clause is required for Daytona teams. If you feel like you're going to roll Daytona, there's a good, like, it's probably in your best interest to at least monster exchange for die if you feel like you will be able to roll them because they're kind of hard to replicate or replace. They just do so much and they're obviously quite luxurious at that point in time, but it does cost five seven star Godfest exclusives. Now, their base form is going to be their best one because in their evolved form, they can be a strong farming based leader because when they match five or more connected light orbs you get your 20 times per 20 times attack multiplier along with having bonus combos when you connect multiple blobbing your orbs basically so blob your light orbs you get bonus combos your full attack multiplier you can farm stuff with relative ease you have high amounts of personal damage and the active skill using attack buff based on the number of seven combos on the team if i'm not mistaken that should be the terminology there so you get an attack buff along with generating a row of light orbs which in theory makes your own system so i guess with lots of these on the team you could swipe farm something throw in some haste somewhere you can recharge them back up and just keep going so it is i think best if you have lots of duplicates but if you have lots of duplicates well that's kind of a different story i feel like you'd be lucky to have even just one copy and if you have one copy the base form is going to be your best place to utilize them. For their weapon assist, it gives you an L unlock, two light rows, two light 
orb enhances. So great for those light farming teams. The active skill gives you three turns of two times orb movement time, two times RCV, and two times attack. So a universal buffer, which is always great. And then you create a single spinner. So a universal buffer is always meaningful. There's going to be lots of debuffs in various dungeons. And if there are spinners included as well, you can overcome them, especially if you're not running anyone who has like the roulette clear awakening with the recover binds through their awakening. So it is an option, but at the same time, if you only have a single copy, their base form is going to be magical. And again, this void damage void is going to be meaningful for even future teams that do not have a way to deal with voids. Daytona is just going to be the next one available, but if we know anything about power creep, weapon assists tend to last the longest, then subs and leaders tend to fall off the fastest because it's easier to print a newer and stronger leader, just include better multipliers. Next is Baron, and Baron is a transforming card. So in their base form, they have three skill boosts, and they have a respectable amount of effective health pre-transforming, which is meaningful if you intend to use them as a leader, because you get 50% damage reduction with seven more combos. You should always be able to do that from a given board. And then you get more damage reduction when you match two or more dark combos. That obviously could be a little bit problematic, but remember, two Barons together at least is 75% damage reduction. Not the greatest, but maybe it's enough for you to survive for floor one. Remember, you do have three skill boosts, and with dual leaders, that'll be six skill boosts. You need 25 to transform, and when you do transform, he becomes quite a magical card overall. So, in his transform state, he has five, five, seven combos. So again, 32 times personal damage on a large attack stat. So that is obviously quite meaningful. He has two enhanced dark combos, so your damage for the entire team will be increased. And then with his post-transform active skill, he has a four-turn cooldown, which gives you one turn of void damage void. So that's obviously meaningful for teams who do not have a way to deal with damage void because, well, you can just match whatever you were matching initially, and you can do your full amount of damage across the entire team. In addition to that, he gets 10 times attack for this particular monster. So Baron is going to double damage cap with ease. If his sub attribute is matching something, he's probably double capping there as well. So just gargantuan amounts of damage output for dark or even possibly even light teams when you use his active skill. You can maybe even make an argument that maybe you could use them on Daytona teams. If you need that dark coverage, you don't have Halloween cotton, you don't have dye, maybe you can make that argument because the board changer at least gives you an orb, it gives you an, a board unlock and then changes the or board to light, dark, and heal orb. So a useful board afterwards. So like obviously it's better on mono dark teams because you take advantage of the enhanced dark combos and as a leader they are still quite competent they have auto fall attack and bonus combos built in so you can double pair and not be missing out too much you get 50 percent damage reduction once again when you match seven or more combos which you should be doing anyways you get auto fall attack when matching those seven combos as well furthermore you get your more attack multiplier and more damage reduction when matching two plus dark combos and then you get bonus combos when you have two or more dark combos so basically you want to hit two or more dark combos, and you'll probably just shoot up to the seven plus combos for your full activation. So you always need to have lots of a reliable source of dark orb generation. And you do have 89.44% damage reduction. Like it is strong. And I guess the only big drawback I can truly foresee is that Mojito and, oh, what's their face? I, the other guy from that same collab, like the current two best dark leaders at this point in time, they are do quite well they can utilize vdp with ease they don't have to rely on these active skills and you could argue that baron could be a sub on those teams but again you're most likely gonna be matching vdps anyways for mojito to actually trigger all of his personal damage so it's not like he's baron's bad it's just that there's other strong dark leaders currently available and this is definitely a much more combo oriented play style you need to have lots of combos of dark combos to deal damage that means vdps could be problematic and again your leaders don't have it of course the active skill solves it but Again, it doesn't quite have the best synergy with Mojito and other mono dark teams at this exact point in time, but I still can foresee them clearing plenty of content. Like this is still a strong sub as well if you really want to use them. Because again, on your, maybe there'll be dark teams in the future who don't want to match VDPs. You could even argue, argue Mikage who has needs to match three or more dark combos can definitely utilize them as a sub because making a VDP with a total of three dark combos for your damage reduction can definitely be much riskier. Maybe you could argue this pairs with Mikage, who knows. Point of the matter is, I think they're still a strong card. It's just that we don't have anywhere truly great to take advantage of them. With that being said, their weapon assist is quite useful, but not necessarily at first glance. The reason for that is two skill binder assists and two team health awakenings. And at this point in time, there are many teams who are lacking skill binder assists. Like, 
you just have cards who just lack this awakening. Like Daytona teams will struggle with it. Any team of gung-ho Belial tends to have issues with skill bind resist as well. The fairies have skill bind resist issues. So this weapon assist solves your skill bind problems while giving bulk. A rare combination at this point in time, which definitely can be meaningful. And the active skill gives you some auto healing and then one turn is 75% damage reduction. 75% damage reduction is sufficient for Shura 3. It won't be enough for MD1 because Black Albert will kit too hard so you need 100% damage void to dodge him. And then you get three times attack for that owning monster. So it's an okay active skill, especially if you can actually take advantage of the damage reduction component. But again, these are valuable awakenings, especially on teams that are starved for skill bind resist. I know to a certain extent, like even for myself, I think skill bind resist just is always present on a given team because that was the case for many, many years. But obviously over time that has changed. So this weapon assist has meaning there as well. So if you feel like you cannot leverage enough value out of their transforming state, their weapon assist will have value for yourself. And next we come to Avon. And Avon in their base form has two skill boosts and they have a 20 turn cooldown. But when they do transform, you get a five turn delay. Huge way to help yourself transform for your other cards, especially cards that need to utilize like multi-step transforms or have longer transformation times. You're able to bridge that gap more easily. And once they do transform, they become quite an interesting dragon. They have triple seven combo with a VDP with a large attack stat. They have two team health, so nice bulk. They have cloud resist, useful awakening there. And then their active skill is a two turn cooldown that unlocks the whole board and changes wood to fire, dark to light orbs. So if you're playing a mono light team who has issues unlocking a board, this can definitely be a valuable usage for it. Orb generation is always meaningful, but I feel like a better usage for them is potentially like running a valuable inherit that's not too long to charge up because once you get into a dungeon, you'll transform five turn delay and then you'll start charging up like their base skill, which will happen in two turns. And then you can charge up the inherit that you brought along because a two turn cooldown is quite easy to work with. And like I said, the base active skill is okay, but it doesn't actually counter mechanics. If you inherit something that counters whatever you need, like attack, debuff, RCV, damage absorption, or even a backup secondary cleric style active skill, that can be meaningful because they do have large amounts of personal damage and bulk for the entire team. In their other form, this is like the non-transforming state, they have potentially 4-7 combos with a VDP or 4-7 with a super blind resist. Useful super wakings overall, large amounts of personal damage. Their active skill gives you two times attack for light and then bypassing damage absorption and attribute absorption for a single turn. Like one turn of damage and, or, and color absorption is really just not enough in this day and age. Almost everything needs at least two and probably three just if you really want to be safe. So I don't really see any true usage for this card at this point in time because all the current dungeons need multi-turn counters so it's just not going to be a sufficient number like sure the personal damage is cool but if you're not doing a valuable enough active skill on an eight turn cooldown it's hard to justify bringing them into a given dungeon maybe but that being said their weapon assist is the most universally helpful one and it's arguably probably the best weapon assist in this event because it gives you a single skill boost two team rcvs and an l unlock awakening and the active skill gives you two turns of haste plus a five turn two times attack buff for that given monster so that given monster will hit harder for the next five turns but you get that haste with the skill boost so it's a three effective skill boost weapon assist which is great. We don't have Amatsu's loot, we have Lena Inverse's Talisman. Those are two of the more valuable weapon assists at this point in time because they give a skill boost, two turns of haste, and some other benefit. This is the closest to Amatsu because Amatsu also has two team RCVs, but instead of a cloud resist, we have an L unlock. And a single L unlock is invaluable on a team. If you have no Ls and this is now inherited, this became probably the best possible inherit you could bring, assuming you can leverage the haste from it as well because you get bonus healing, you have an L unlock. One L is pretty much needed to have on a given team because you can unlock orbs, you can get rid of locked skyfalls. But obviously Amasu of the Clouders may be helpful as well because Clouders may be less common. But point of the matter is, it's an incredibly valuable weapon assist and you might think, well, it doesn't seem super flashy and magical overall, like for all like five, seven star God Pets exclusives, but I can pretty much guarantee you that this is going to be a weapon assist, especially if you don't own Amatsu or Lena Inverse, that you're going to be using over and over and over again on a variety of teams. So it, in terms of like long-term investment for universal value, this weapon assist is going to be the best from this event overall. And it is at least tradable. Again, don't have Amatsu, don't have Lena Inverse, 
strongly consider trading for Avan just to access this weapon assist. It may not look the flashiest right now, but I can pretty much guarantee you're going to use it over and over again moving forward at this point in time. So all those three cards can be monster exchange for if any of them are truly appealing for yourself. And now we come to the seven star cards, which cannot be tradable, unfortunately. You have to roll for them. So this is definitely a little bit problematic. And the first one is pop. And Pop is really popping off because they have a Water Sub Attribute, which is kind of an awkward color to cover, I feel, for rainbow coverage for mono red teams because, well, you have issues with, if you're like, say, Rosalind teams, you may not necessarily have a good water card. Obviously, if you have Seawolf, it's not an issue. But then if it's a Seawolf team, hey, at least the Sub Attribute will actually be doing modest amounts of damage. If we look at their Awakenings, they have two skill boosts, they have super jam resist, they have a VDP and triple seven combo. So right away, they have solid amounts of personal damage. They have a resist, they have a large attack stat. They have a ability to take either two skill boosts or cloud resist or the three attribute offensive awakening. So they take the three attribute offensive awakening, their personal damage goes from eight times to 20 times, plus the VDP on top of that would be like higher 40 50 times personal damage large amounts of personal damage is my point if you take that other offensive awakening and assuming you hatch match three or other colors there's a good chance maybe you can depending on the given team you're running through again rosalind teams will probably be a bit easier because you have that big seven by six board and rosalind just randomly generates fire orbs so a strong option there and then if we look at their active skill it's actually amazingly strong it gives you four on a four turn cooldown you have a full unable to match orb effect clear you have 35 percent damage reduction and 1.5 times orb movement time the 35 percent damage reduction may or may not be enough but ensure a three maybe that is actually enough for you to tank hexazeon's attack while below 50 percent hit for the first time so that is meaningful there. It has a time buff, but this unmatchable is meaningful because Amino Uzume is a Pantheon card who gained status as one of the best fire clerics available, probably the best fire cleric available, but they have some problems clearing unmatchable. This is a wonderful alternative to um, Wedding Trello if you never acquired her. This is a powerful alternative and they have huge amounts of personal damage. They definitely can take double damage cap and abuse it with relative ease, I'd say overall. So you've got a nice backup way to clear unmatchable or movement time and a small shield, which may or may not be helpful. But again, it's a four turn cooldown, meaningful overall. You can inherit something over top of it for a big boost at the beginning of the dungeon. Maybe a delay, maybe a haste, whatever you need to have, pop will be your individual. If we take a look at their evolve form, they could have up to six skill boosts, which is cool, or they can have four, three attribute awakenings. So potentially large amounts of personal damage once again, but they're not as strong as they used to be, because like as in their other form, because four turn cooldown, you can bypass attribute absorb for one turn. Well, we've already established that one turn of damage or color absorb is really just not sufficient enough in this day and age. So that's problematic. And then sure, they get five times attack. But again, this is not an active skill that's as meaningful. Their base form's active skill is so powerful by comparison. And in theory, like even if you're not using mono fire, like it could technically be used on like more rainbow oriented teams if you need other ways to clear unmatchable. Like it's not as restrictive because it doesn't like necessarily take orbs away into red. So like I just am not as impressed with this form here and their weapon assist like, it does give you two team health and 60% poison risk, which is cool. You get a 75% damage reduction. And then again, if you're above half health, you get four times attack for water. Like, it is cool, but their base form is really just going to be the form that gives you the most value overall, I would say. So if you had a single copy, I would only truly consider their base form. Ma'am, in her base form, gives you a ability to have super poison resist, large amounts of VDP damage, and then Rose as well. So, like, you have... It's kind of a weird mix, I feel, overall, but again, they can have significant amounts of VDP damage. Their base active skill on a four turn cooldown unlocks the board, creates three fire and hard orbs at random, and then if your health is below or equal to 50%, you remove all awoken skill binds. So it's quite a conditional way to remove awoken skill binds. I feel like it would be quite difficult to really set it up, but maybe if it pans out, it will obviously be helpful. It does give you some orb generation, but I feel like they will have more value in their evolved form because in their evolved form they have triple seven combo they have a super poison resist they can get a vdp like high attacks i feel like four thousand has become the new norm everything has like 4k attack now at this point in time and then they have a six turn cooldown that gives changes the enemy's attribute to wood for a single turn so your mono fire teams just gained a two times buff attack buff so to speak 
against the opposing spawn because red deals twice as much damage against green spawns and this helps your whole team if the opposing spawn is blue to start you just went from dealing half damage to two times damage a four times swing so this is kind of like wedding yuri wedding yuri in the sense that, like it's pretty cool it could have cool applications perhaps but I'm not sure how we can truly leverage it at this point in time because I do honestly believe like lots of sub slots are quite competitive at this point in time. But maybe if there's a dungeon where there's a durable water spawn that you just can't really deal with for your mono fire teams, maybe this might have something to might have some value. In their weapon assist, they have two team health and two team RCVs with two fire rows. So bulk some healing a bit of passive damage if you make the rows not terrible awakenings overall their active skill is a 20 turn cooldown so it better be valuable so for five turns they get three times rcv three times attack and for two turns you bypass void damage void effects so i guess if you are playing a team and you don't have good ways to deal with damage void you can argue that this will be meaningful the buffs are cool as well like it will be long lasting and possibly helpful hopefully two turns is enough for you so like i think it's an okay weapon assist but on a 20 turn cooldown you're gonna probably be able, only be able to use it one time in a given dungeon and then that's it so you better hope your void damage void you have other ways to deal with void spawns later on if you're relying on this active skill for or the weapon assist for the active skill for Hyan, I cannot pronounce this name. In their base form, they have triple seven combo and can have a cross awakening or another seven combo. Cross awakening helps you deal with sticky blinds, so that might be situationally helpful. Then the three enhanced dark combos greatly augment the damage output of your entire team, especially when you're matching multiple dark combos. Their active skill gives you one turn of no skyfalls and then one turn of reducing damage taken by 75%. And then two times orb movement time. So if you need a 75% damage reduction shield and it is a meaningful thing for the dungeon you're playing through, this individual can definitely be a useful card to bring overall. But if 75% damage reduction is not sufficient, say an MD, well MD1, it's not going to be a useful sub. And then in Shura 3, the lack of a sub attribute color could make it difficult to bring on a given team. So I think it's cool, but I'm not quite sure how we can truly leverage it. Like strong and hard hitting for the whole team, yes. In their evolved form, they have a 10 combo, a 7 combo, so already better offensive awakenings, and a devil killer, so obviously devils get completely obliterated. They still can get a 7 combo or a cross awakening through their super awakening, so much higher personal damage in this form already. They have a super blind resist and an L, so more utility, and I like these awakenings more overall. Like, if we compare their awakenings, the only advantage their base form has is the passive team damage, which obviously may or may not be sufficient. But from personal damage point of view, their evolved form is better with also that super blind resist, which in turn can free up other inheritance slot or just team building composition options. Their active skill gives you one turn of two times or movement time, RCV, and two times attack for light. So a universal buffer. A universal buffer on a five turn cooldown is meaningful. It's kind of like Sophie, I feel almost. Sophie's a five turn cooldown by comparison, but Sophie lacks the super blind resist. Sophie also lacks the L. Sophie has more killers, but again, damage probably is pretty high anyways with this large attack set. And again, double 20 times personal damage already. It's pretty high. In addition to that, you change the far left column to light and the far right column to dark orb. So universal buffer with orb generation. So obviously, if you can take advantage of the orb generation, this becomes much more meaningful. I feel like this is actually a much more appealing sub. Again, it has that light sub attribute. So for sure, three, it does ease up some team building constraints. And again, because they're non-transforming, you can inherit something over top of them in order to have something more impactful at the beginning of a dungeon. For their weapon assist, they get a skill boost and a physical killer and three and two enhanced dark orbs. So some personal damage if you have physical spawns. A skill boost is always helpful. More orb more enhances, so mono dark benefits or teams that convert dark to their useful elements. The active skill is four turns of 60% damage reduction. So that's a long lasting shield. And it also gives you flexibility in the sense that you probably could just utilize that to stall at the beginning of a dungeon because it lasts for so long. It's kind of like a pseudo delay if you just don't die. And then at the end, for like Hexazion and Shura 3, you have more wiggle room in case you miss time or miscount their timer and you get hit by, like you don't trigger the attack while below 50% the first time. You have this backup shield as well, but like it's a reasonable strong shield overall for a 13 turn cooldown, I feel. You also reduce unable to match orb effects by nine, like fully clear unmatchable and remove all awoken skill binds. So it does quite a few different things at the same time. So it can definitely be meaningful if you need to have like an extra cleric style active skills and inherit that also can double up as something meaningful 
this can definitely be helpful overall. I'm going to take a look at Leona further down because I mistyped it when I was doing this. So we're going to take it Leona, who's another seven star card. So Leona in her base form has super blinders, this three enhanced heart combos or heart orb awakening. So their large attack RCV stat, they're a huge healing solution and they can have up to six skill boosts or four skill boosts with a cloud or four skill boosts with a cross awakening. So cross awakenings can clear sticky blinds or maybe give a little bit of personal damage, but personal damage is pretty much insignificant because they just have no other personal damage and a low attack stat, but a strong healing solution overall. And then their active skill gives you one turn of RCV buffing, which is always helpful, and then fully clear unmatchable and remove all awoken skill binds. Doesn't clear regular binds, but if your team is already bind immune, that's not a problem. So a six turn full cleric style card with large amounts of skill boost, with super blinders this with a healing solution valuable card to have all around for your mono light teams a great cleric solution overall and it's definitely most appealing in their base form if we take a look at their evolve form they have more crosses and they have super jammer resist so they have some personal damage potentially they have large amounts of skills they have movement time and then for their active skill they get five turns of Reduced 15% um, damage reduction. I don't quite know if 15% damage reduction will ever be enough for anything. So it's kind of like extending the length of the cooldown, unfortunately. You also have five turns of two times RCV and two times attack. But if you're running cards that just do attack buffs with their system style, it's going to be kind of redundant. So I'm disappointed by this active skill overall. For their leader skill you could maybe argue that they have some leadership potential with phyllis like they have large amounts of bulk huge amounts of rcv but the problem is the lack of damage reduction either their forms means gravities are much more dangerous but phyllis obviously comes with damage reduction but even then obviously double phyllis is stronger and again i'm not a huge fan of their form here in their weapon assist they have three recover bind awakening so roulette clearing is incredibly easy with this weapon assist two team rcvs and a team health so useful bulk and healing potential overall i like these awakenings for the active skill itself you get two times rcv and two times attack and reduce all unmatchable and all awoken skill binds on a seven turn cooldown for a full cleric active skill that's not transforming that also gives buffs this is actually quite powerful and in all honesty you could most certainly inherit this over top of a given card that has a low base cooldown to transform them into a full cleric potentially and if that card with the low base cooldown has meaningful amounts of personal damage or awakenings it just upgraded your team overall and even though it's a two times attack buff for light you can just use this across any given team because RCV buffing is helpful and attack buff overrides any existing debuff. So I like this weapon assist. I also like her base form for her cleric potential for your mono light teams. Going back up to the other six stars present, we have Hadlar. So Hadlar in their base form has three enhanced dark combos, a team HP, four skill boosts, and then a 10 and 7 combo with the ability to gain a VDP through Super Awakening. So large amounts of personal damage. They can actually hurt Void Spawns, which is nice. Their active skill is a 9 turn cooldown. It gives you a 3 times attack buff for Devils and then 2 turn delay. It's an okay active skill. Like 2 turns delay is not bad. It can be helpful possibly later on in Dungeon because lots of spawns nowadays can be delayed part way through. The attack buff is probably going to be higher than the other attack buffs you bring because most of the attack buffs that work off Awakenings tend to be a little lower. So... It can be a way to add a little bit extra zest. And again, personal damage is high. The team damage is high. Just a nice dark sub to have. It's not like the best at anything, but it's not, again, terrible at anything overall. For their leader skill, they have fixed amounts of movement time. If you're a devil type card, you have more bonuses, but you lack damage reduction. So lacking damage reduction is really just awkward at this point in time. So I just feel like it's a little bit problematic for the most part. In their evolved form, they have... Again, the four skill boosts, they have super jam resist, they have tape resist, they have three, uh, three, they have three, three attribute awakenings. So they have large amounts of personal damage there. They could get a VDP or another three attribute super through their super awakening. So again, large amounts of personal damage there, a nice amount of resist of through super res, jammer and tape. And then their active skill changes all orbs to fire, water, dark, and heal. And then if your health is above 50%, you get two turns of attribute absorb cancellation. So that's actually pretty useful overall. Like you get a three color board with hearts. And again, if you're using Gojo or Nocteria, this is a wonderful sub to have on your team because 
it's a valuable orb changer it lets you activate all the stuff you want to have it gives you attribute absorption if that's relevant or needed but again it's just a nice backup thing large amounts of personal damage here as well good resist so a solid card overall like not necessarily the best but a solid card to have for their leader skill they have large amounts large attack multiplier and quite a hefty amount of damage reduction with bonus combos but you have to match five or more connected fire orbs which is kind of weird for the damage reduction and then forget the bonus combos you need five or more connected fire so like you want to match fire so it's kind of awkward i feel like the like the numbers look nice on paper but it's just awkward i feel like having to blob fire orbs while also needing dark it's just a little bit of a hurdle especially because the fact that you can't system their active skill and then for their weapon assist they have full bind immunity and four enhanced dark orbs so that's a significant amount of team damage overall and then the active skill on a 20 turn cooldown changes all orbs to fire water dark and hearts and then for three turns you get two, half of your rcv this also overrides any rcv debuff so that possibly is helpful and then you get three turns of damage absorb and attribute absorb cancellation so like i said three turns is a great amount for this cancellation obviously the rcv penalty can be a little problematic but you obviously want to try and take advantage of the board changer so it's a nice option but i don't feel like it's superior to the other three turn damage absorption cancellation cards out there but again it's three turns of color and damage absorbed so it's actually pretty decent overall next is mr Vern and they have three dark rows and lot three enhanced dark combos or four enhanced dark combos but you probably want to take the super poison resist i feel overall lots of skill boost as well their active skill on a 13 turn cooldown gives you two turns of haste and then it changes the top row and bottom row to dark orbs so i definitely can foresee this being utilized on farming based teams where you want to match lots of dark rows you make the dark rows you get the haste you can break up the second row match the second row on the subsequent turn high value in that regards overall and if you utilize them as a leader you need to match two plus dark combos so they're not quite the best for farming purposes because you can't really tap into the row plus something else because that needs nine dark orbs but again as a sub not a bad damage stick for everyone else perhaps in their evolved form i feel like they're a bit better for like non-farming content because they have double 10 combo they have cloud resist they have skill boost they have potentially two enhanced dark combo awakenings but i probably would take poison resist still anyways on a 14 turn cooldown they get a four times attack buff for dark and then two turns of void damage void so it obviously has synergy with themselves it has synergy on barren teams as well because damage void is a problem and having more options as backups is helpful but again baron already kind of does that already so it's probably not necessary to have them on the team because like you probably have enough ways to deal with void damage void but it is something to have perhaps overall maybe if we start getting more dark teams that just really cannot deal with voids like or just don't have the orb generation to sustain it maybe this could have a bit more value in the future but again huge amounts of personal damage with double 10 combo just double 10 combo just is way too much damage overall for their weapon assist they have the enhanced dark combo so team gets more damage in three rows lots of damage for your team and then the active skill is a four turn cooldown that gives you one turn of no skyfalls and creating a single spinner so there are not too many spinners overall like ways to counter spinners by generating them so as an active skill on a four turn cooldown this definitely can be meaningful potentially but i say it's quite niche overall and that being said we have now come to the base six star cards and the base six star cards are much weaker by comparison they do have weapon assist but i i will struggle to feel like they have really much value outside of their base of outside of their weapon assist form because like it's difficult to be competitive when like your weighted stats are potentially lower you may not have the best awakenings or active skills so for crocodine they have potentially nice amounts of passive damage modest amounts of personal damage as well you get to change the sec in column from the left and second column from right to heal orbs and then change the second row from the top and the second row from the bottom to wood orbs it's a weird board changer overall so like i feel like for farming or like maybe a like ranking dungeon or something like something weird may utilize this active skill because it's just a weird effect overall because you're making well you're going to be making five so 10 hard orbs and then you're override two of them so you get six hard orbs and 12 wood orbs you're making 18 orbs in total so 
it's pretty cool, but like I'm not quite sure where we can really utilize it. So like obviously for like non like weird farming or ranking dungeon content, it's gonna have less value overall. So it's hard to justify their inclusion. Their weapons just gives you a single skill by resist, three enhanced wood orbs, and a team R team HP. They also give a f three turn delay and then three turn attack buff. So if you're lacking strong delay weapons, this is not a bad thing. It's obviously inferior to like Shelling Ford or the Monster Hunter Horn, but it is an option. Again, bottom rarity, so you gotta taper your expectations accordingly. Remember, the bottom rarity is probably what you're gonna roll the most majority of the time. So just pay attention to the section to see if any of these seem appealing because this will kind of influence whether or not rolling more is a good idea. Zaborio has some personal damage, some passive damage. They have jam resist, some movement time. They give a poison, which is probably completely useless, and a two turn delay and creating six dark orbs. Like, it's cool, but really just not enough in this day and age. Their weapon assist is actually quite interesting. They give a skill binder assist, which again, I've established is useful for many teams nowadays. A cross awakening, which is incredibly rare to have, which means you have a possible solution to sticky blinds, which is definitely meaningful. You have 20% blind resist, which I guess is cool. And then the active skill on a nine turn cooldown gives you one spinner as well at for three turns as well as unlocking the board and changing all of to wood, dark, and heal. So a pretty cool active skill, a pretty cool weapon overall. Like I feel like as far as a bottom rarity weapon goes, this is quite unique and I would love to have at least one copy of this because it's doing quite a few different things that is just difficult to replicate. There are not many spinner generating active skills available and not many cross awakening weapon assists. So pretty useful thing to have overall, I'd say for a bottom rarity. For Flazard, in their base form, they mix red and blue. So like Seawolf teams might think, hooray! And they have reasonable amounts of personal damage of potentially double seven with VDP and a super poison or triple seven VDP. So it's okay. The active skill gives you no sky falls for two turns, unlocks the board, changes the far left to water, far right to fire. This is not solving any problems. So I just like, I just feel like you couldn't really include it on a given team unless you're truly desperate for something. In their evolved form, they have two cross awakenings. They have seven combos. They have some movement time. They have poison. Like it's a mixture of awakenings. And then on a five turn cooldown, they get three times attack for this given monster. And then they create a cross of fire orbs on the board. Like it's not solving any problems. It's not even that great of a card overall. Like it has some personal damage, but not that much personal damage. So again, I just find it difficult to include them on a given team. For their weapon assist, they have, come on Discord, you can do it. They have an L and then two enhanced water and two enhanced fire orbs. So an okay spread. Again, if you don't have an L, much more meaningful weapon assist. And then two turns, you get 75% damage reduction. So that's a big shield. You get to unlock the board and create a column of fire, column of water. So again, if 75% damage reduction is meaningful, like sure a two, sure a three, this weapon assist can have value for your given team. And especially if you don't have an L, even more value. So again, it is kind of, kind of a niche weapon assist, kind of like most of them here. But again, you're probably going to be picking up some copies of these if you do roll in this event. For Lar Heart, they have some, they have lots of rows and they have a bit of personal damage. Their active skill gives you six turns of no skyfall. So if you're farming stuff, no skyfalls is good because you go faster. You get plus one combo, which kind of slows you down anyways. And then you change the bottom row to Dark Orb. So like maybe this could be useful. Maybe it won't. Hard to say, pretty situational overall. For their weapon assist, they have two team R team HP awakening, some auto healing, and then they get three turns of 25% healing, which is just weird and not that helpful, and then three turns of 75% damage reduction. So again, it's a long lasting shield, but I feel like we're starting to get to the point where 75% damage reduction is just not as helpful sometimes because there's a lot of things that just hit too hard, which is kind of a weird thing to say. So it's an okay weapon if you need shielding. It does give you bulk. So again, it might be situationally helpful. Again, it's nice to have at least probably one of each copy because again, they might just do something you may not be able to overcome. Whoops. For Chu or him in their base form, they have some team health. They have some personal damage. I'm saying some, and that's kind of just like the trend for these bottom rarity cards but their active skill gives you a board unlock creates three fire light and dark so again not solving any problems really hard to justify using them their weapon assist gives you a skill boost two enhanced light orbs and their active skill gives you one turn of a hundred percent damage reduction hundred percent damage reduction is good solves md black alberch gives you 
perfect stalling at the beginning of the dungeon as well for at least a given turn. And then you change all orbs to fire, light, dark, and heal. So not a it's, a, it's okay. It's situational again. Not the best 100% damage reduction weapon out there, but it is something. Again, this bottom rarity gives you something. They do a bit of some stuff. And then finally we come to Chu, who is the last card of the rare machine portion of this event. They can have double 10 combo, so large amounts of personal damage, but... I feel like it's just hard to utilize them because for four turns you get 30% damage reduction. I don't know if 30% will be enough. Maybe it is. Maybe it won't be. Like we've used Gung Ho Lakshmi for her 30%. So maybe it might be enough on your given team. And then one turn you get 1.5 times attack. So like maybe if the shield is useful, maybe. But again, it's going to be kind of an awkward card. Like I guess maybe they're maybe a little less awkward because they have double 10 combo with a blind or super blind. So you could argue that they have some value there overall. And then for their weapon assist, they give a skill boost, two enhanced wood orbs, and then one turn of no skyfalls, and one turn only fire, wood, and hard orbs will appear and then replace all orbs. It's just such a niche and like weird weapon assist. You can't use it for ranking dungeons to like abutilize like bicolors and then like force skyfall solving because the no skyfall clause. So it's like, I'm not quite sure how to utilize it, but it's there. It's just, again, these weapon assists are niche, but probably worth having at least one copy of. So... In summary, this collab or Dragon Quest collab has situational weapon assist at the bottom rarity, which is what you're going to be rolling the vast majority of time. They have great subs across the top rarities. And then obviously at the very top, you have strong monster exchange options with die for Daytona teams. Baron is just a strong mono dark card, especially if we have more teams in the future that need to um, abuse like cancel void, like can't deal with voids, can be more meaningful. And again, his weapon assist has two skill minuses, two team healths, which is great for current endgame teams who tend to lack this awakening. And then Avon has this wonderful weapon assist, which is on all honesty possibly worth picking up, especially if you don't have Amitsu loot or Lena Inverse. So that being said, let me know what you think about the Dragon Quest collab in the comments down below. Do you think it's worth rolling in? And if you did roll, let me know how it turned out. For myself, I do plan to do some rolls on my Twitch stream later on today, and I'll post the rolling video hopefully tonight or tomorrow morning. With that being said, hopefully you all have a truly fantastic day. I wish you all the best luck in your own pad adventures, and... Happy puzzling.